As you're finding your seats and finding your way to Daniel chapter five, I'm gonna take a few moments and remind us where we are. I do like the sign in the mall that says, you are here. And I think those are kind of going extinct. I think the mall knows me and knows that if I get in, I have a hard time getting out. I need that you are here sign, not to find my favorite store, but to find the nearest exit. And they don't want me to exit. Uh, We're gonna back up a little bit this evening and just give us a you are here sign for the book of Daniel. You'll remember that Daniel chapter one is an introduction, the deportation of Jewish slaves to Babylonian exile. Daniel chapter two through seven is written in Aramaic. That is the language of the court of Babylon. And it is set for the audience of that court. It has primarily a Gentile audience in mind it has significance for Jews looking in, listening in as captives, and certainly has tremendous benefit for us looking in on the fate of God's people in Babylonian captivity. But we are right there in the middle of the Aramaic section. In fact, we are squarely in the middle. And if you remember, I've got the kind of poetic structure of chapters two through seven up on the slide again for us. We looked at this a few weeks ago. But there is a a, a way that Hebrew likes to arrange Uh, material such that what shows up in the center is the apex or what is being highlighted in a given text. And so we have one of those structures that spans from chapter two to chapter seven, and you see parallels working, telescoping outward to the inward. So chapter two and chapter seven both give a broad sweep of history. You remember Daniel chapter two was the vision of the golden statue and Daniel chapter seven we'll get to is the broad sweep of history giving the the same four empires that will exist except in beast form rather than statue form. You move inward to chapters three and chapter six and you see God delivering his people. The three Hebrew slaves from the fiery furnace in chapter three and Daniel himself from a den of lions in chapter six. And then right there in the middle, the, the central focus of this Gentile section This, where God is giving a message in Aramaic to the Babylonian court in their own language. God humbles a Gentile king. And we finished up with the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar last time we were together. We're moving on this evening to the humbling of Belshazzar. So that's where we find ourselves in the second installation of God humbling a Gentile king. This is the leveling of human pride and the leveling of human pride of the highest order, the most powerful men on the earth are being brought low by the one true God. And what is so fascinating as we compare chapter four and five, the difference between God's humbling of of Belshazzar with his humbling of Nebuchadnezzar is that God humbles Nebuchadnezzar in life unto confessions and ultimately unto a doxology. Nebuchadnezzar goes from admitting that the God of Israel is real, that he actually does things, and then finally that he is the one true God and no other God should be worshiped. But when we get to Belshazzar, we find that God humbles this pagan Gentile king another way, by elimination. There are no confessions. There is no doxology here only the flat out removal of this king of Babylon. That's where we find ourselves this evening, God humbles another Gentile king. That is what Daniel chapter five is about. What we're going to do is read the first 12 verses this evening, and then on December 26th, we'll pick up the rest of the chapter, Lord willing. So read with me, Daniel chapter five, beginning in verse one. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank the wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. 
The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. We're going to look at God's humbling of this Gentile king this evening in three segments. This will only get us the first part of the story, and we'll come back for the rest again on the 26th. But the first segment of this story is the stupidest party. The stupidest party. Uh, look at verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. And in case you're wondering, yes, stupidest is a word. Merriam-Webster says it's a word. It's the superlative form of stupid, and you can say most stupid or stupidest. They're both legitimate. They've both been around for several hundred years and in use in the English language. Um, stupid, of course, means to be slow of mind. It can be unintelligent in decisions or acts, acting in a careless manner, lacking intelligence or reason, or dulled in feeling or sensation, or being marked by unreasoned thinking or acting. And this party was all of that. This was the stupidest of parties. Notice Belshazzar the king. That's going to get us started on a little historical background. There's a transition here from chapter 4 to chapter 5 in Daniel that is absolutely abrupt. It feels like the, the wheels have come off in the storytelling. If we read chapter thir or verse 37 of chapter 4, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Belshazzar is about to walk in pride. It is radically abrupt in theme, radically abrupt in the content of the narration, and it's really interesting the, the time that is skipped. We move from Nebuchadnezzar's confession and doxology to Belshazzar's party, and there's probably at least a quarter of a century between these two verses a quarter of a century, and four administrations. We move in chapter 4 from the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign in chapter 5 to the very last night of the Babylonian Empire. And all that happens in between doesn't even get a mention in the text. And this abruptness is important because of the lessons that Daniel the writer wants to communicate. God is conveying a specific message here, both to the Babylonian court, to all who would listen... Remember, Nebuchadnezzar published the findings of his own humiliation to the known world, but also important for the Jewish exiles and for all of us readers. God's message is critical. It is this, God humbles the proud. Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar in two different ways. It, and it's really remarkable to think about God's sovereignty and the difference between his humbling of these two kings. He can take the same kind of arrogant clay and make a worshiper or an object lesson of his wrath. Whatever the world looks like politically, God is sovereign over human governments. God wants us to know that very clearly in the transition between chapter four and chapter five. God has no rivals, he has no peers. In his absolute sovereignty, he is over all the affairs of mankind. And he is ushering human history toward the great overthrow of all merely human societies unto the establishment and the installment of Messiah and Messiah's kingdom on the earth. 
The intervening details of the political machinations and governmental instability would further illustrate the puniness of man and our need to trust the living God, but they're not critical to Daniel's telling of the story. But for us in our day, we need to back out a little bit, examine some history, and find out what happened between the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign and the last night of the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar's 43-year reign came to an end in 562 BC, and the next 23 years gets us up to Belshazzar's party in chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by his son, Evil Merodach. I don't know if any of you have named your son Evil, unless your last name is Knievel or Merodach. He reigned two years. He gets a mention in 2 Kings 25. And in fact, Evil Merodach is uh, giving kindness to Israel. And we don't know if, if he has uh, been amazed at God's keeping of his people. I don't know if he learned some lessons from his father Nebuchadnezzar, but evil Merodach actually set the last king of Judah free, Jehoiachin, from prison, exchanged his prison clothes for royal clothes, and had him sit at his royal table on a daily basis. We don't know much else about evil Merodach. He reigned two years. He was assassinated by his brother-in-law, Nergal Sherezer. Nergal Shariza reigned for four years and was succeeded by his son, Labashi Marduk. Labashi Marduk was on the throne for a month or two and was assassinated in a conspiracy against the crown. One of the conspirators, Nabonidus, not related to any of the aforementioned kings of Babylon, took the throne. Nabonidus reigned 17 years over Babylon right up to the end of the Babylonian Empire in 539 B.C. In his last 10 years, Nabonidus was absent from the capital city. He set up his offices in Tima, which is now in Saudi Arabia, 500 miles south of the city of Babylon. It was thought that for political and religious reasons, he had to leave Babylon because he was not a Marduk worshiper. He was a pantheist, so Marduk was on his shelf of gods to worship, but he really loved the moon god named Sin. And that wasn't popular in Babylon proper with all the Marduk worshipers, and so in order to uphold political stability in the city, uh, he left, and he left his son, Belshazzar, to rule the city of Babylon. Belshazzar was co-regent of the empire and king of the district of Babylon proper for the last 10 years of the empire's existence. Belshazzar was a Marduk worshiper and was more welcome in the city than his father. That brings us up to October 12th, 539 BC, the last night of the Babylonian empire the night of this stupidest of parties. Why was this party stupid, careless, senseless? Because Babylon was surrounded. The armies of the Medes and the Persians under Cyrus the Persian had conquered Babylon's armies in skirmishes far and wide. On this night, they were encamped around the greatest city on earth. Babylon was now the Alamo. It was the last holdout against this great army. The Medo-Persian army had already beaten the Babylonians 50 miles away, we don't know if word of this last skirmish had reached Babylon yet, but Nabonidus was taken captive. The city of Babylon proper was the last vestige of the once vast empire, and it was now surrounded. The city was thought to be impregnable. It, remember, it had those double walls that were so wide at the top that chariots could pass each other. It had a massive deep moat that was thought to be impenetrable. There were defensive battlements all around. And the Euphrates River flowed right through the city with barred gates on either end of it so they could get endless supply of fresh water. Ancient historians tell us that the city was stocked with food that could have lasted 20 years. So they could have withstood any siege. But we find out in Daniel chapter 8, as Daniel there does a... Uh, backward look at a vision he had in the third year of Belshazzar's reign, Daniel had already predicted the end of the Babylonian Empire. And if you remember back to chapter one, Daniel describing, we get the benefit as readers of, of Daniel describing his own tenure that he himself would outlive the Babylonian Empire, Daniel 1-2. And then you remember the scene where Daniel is explaining the statue vision to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says to Nebuchadnezzar, after you will be. We know that Babylon comes to an end already in the book of Daniel. And besides, what impregnable fortress could stay the mighty hand of the one true God whenever he decided he wanted to depose some petty king? 
So as safe as Belshazzar and his nobles thought they might have been, they were surrounded by an enemy army. Whether he was aware of it or not, his father Nabonidus was a POW. His army was defeated, his city was surrounded, he was living in a false sense of security, and he partakes in a drunken revelry, senseless idolatry, and shameless blasphemy. That's this party. Look at verse 1. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. There's a thousand important men in the kingdom, and they are taking alcohol to excess. Verse 1 tells us Belshazzar was drinking the wine. The verb form here means a continual thing that he's doing. In verse 2, we find out that his wives and concubines are also present. Secular ancient historians actually record this party. They universally tell us that Babylon fell on the night of a great banquet. They describe the party as one of drinking to excess and immorality. This was a night of drunken sensual revelry. Why is Belshazzar having this party? Uh, There are a number of possible reasons. It could be he wants to consolidate power of the empire after Nabonidus' defeat and potential capture. He would then be the sole ruler of Babylon, and maybe he wanted to secure loyalty from all of the nobles. Secondly, uh, Belshazzar could have been seeking to build morale amongst his leadership, to rally the leadership in preparation for a long fight against the the Medo-Persian armies, to give a show of confidence. We have nothing to worry about here in our impregnable fortress. We can hold out for decades. That confidence given to his leaders could be passed on to the army, uh, to the defenders of the city and the people of the city. But maybe he just wanted a party on the eve of demise. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. This is a drunken diversion from reality. Or maybe he's just careless, irresponsible, not even aware of what's going on outside these walls. Let's just party because we can. Some historians have suggested that there was a customary annual religious festival And the Persian armies, knowing that the Babylonians would be worshiping in some sort of drunken revelry at this time, figured this would be a good time to attack. And Belshazzar takes this party farther down the tracks of arrogant, insolent stupidity. Look at verse 2. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Here Belshazzar is taking this party farther than drunken revelry and is adding personal affront to Yahweh, the God of Israel, by asking for the sacred objects taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And why is he doing this? I think he's doing this to assert his notoriety and his power. Perhaps he wants to outdo his predecessors in proving that his gods could keep him safe and provide him what he wanted. Maybe he wanted to one-up the great Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had left those gold and silver vessels from the temple of Jerusalem in his treasury. They weren't for common use. They were trophies of war, and they were put away. They were on the, on the shelf showing that the Babylonian armies had conquered the armies of Israel. But Belshazzar now brings them out for his drunken feast. And he might be thinking to himself, look, Jerusalem has been in ruins now for nearly 70 years. <laughs> What can any God of Jerusalem do to me? Let's get those gold cups. What is there to fear? Look down at verse 3. Then they brought out the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. So verse 3 tells us this plan was carried out and the party went on. Verse 3 adds to verse 2 by calling the temple in Jerusalem the house of God. A little bit more personal. It was not customary for ancient, for oriental, eastern kings to drink in front of others. They didn't drink at parties. It was not customary for an oriental king to feast in front of others. Uh, they weren't gluttons before their people. These ancient kings dined and drank alone out of sight. They were not to be seen out of control. It was also not customary to have women present at such gatherings, and it was quite against custom to defame other gods or to profane sacred objects. 
these pantheistic kings who worshiped lots of gods, they could tolerate other deities besides their own local favorites, but they dared not risk offending some deity unnecessarily, and their superstitions prevented certain levels of sacrilege. And all of these customs went out the window for this party. Belshazzar is leading the charge in drinking. His wives and his concubines are present, and he is boldly profaning the sacred objects from the temple of Yahweh. And one more step down, look at verse four. They drank the wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. This is a toast in Yahweh's golden vessels to the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, to materials, to created matter. And the irony here is that Belshazzar's objects of worship are the materials that Yahweh's cups are made of. They're nothings. How low can man go in his rejection of the one true God? When we reject the living God, what do we substitute for him in our affections, our longing, our adoration? Silly things, material things, nothings. Romans 1.23 says, Re rejecting the true God, men have turned to worship images of man and birds and animals and reptiles. A low esteem of God we, we have naturally and how perverse are we naturally that any old created thing seems a reasonable substitute for God. Yahweh transcends the universe, fills it, goes beyond it, sustains it, holds it in the palm of his hand, and here Belshazzar worships materials in drunken defiance against God, taunting the living God by profaning his set-apart objects. And remember the theological battle that's going on in this book of Daniel. God will vindicate his identity. He will bring shame to all who trust in idolatry. He will humble the proud. He will lay low those who have trusted in the gods of the nations. That is why God's people are in captivity in the first place. The people of Israel and Judah have gone after all the gods of the nations, and effectively God said, look, you want the gods of the Babylonians? I'll give you the gods of the Babylonians. I'll put you in captivity in Babylon. You want the gods of the Assyrians? I'll put you there. Idolatry is the reason that God's people are captive. It is not proof that the Assyrians or the Babylonians had better gods. <laughs> although that's what the Babylonians and the Assyrians before them assumed. They were convinced that their gods must be superior because they were able to conquer Israel and take her people captive. What good are your gods? <laughs> my God just gave you into my hands. But the God of Israel will be faithful to his own name. He will rescue his people. He will bring to an end every human kingdom and he will punish all idolaters. That is the theological battle going on in this book. This party that Belshazzar is hosting is theologically and circumstantially tone deaf. It is unaware. It is the height of arrogance. It is stupid. The Medo-Persian armies are at our gates. Let's get all our important people together. Let's get drunk and immoral. Let's taunt the living God. That is not a good plan. One writer captures the reality of a scene this way, quote, not only their ill-timed merriment, their trampling on the customary proprieties and their drunkenness, but even their foolhardy and blasphemous insult to the most high God is veiled over and cloaked up with the presence of religious devotion. This was as far as it was possible for human daring and infatuation to go. It was more than the powers of heaven would quietly endure. The divine resentment broke out on the spot. That leads us to the second segment of Daniel chapter five. It is a divine intrusion, a divine intrusion. Look at verse five. Suddenly, and this is like the suddenly in chapter four, verse 33, when suddenly Nebuchadnezzar was driven away in insanity from the presence of society. Here's another suddenly. The fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. 
this second immediately after Nebuchadnezzar went to pasture brings about the divine intrusion. God stops the party. In 1899, archeologist Coldaway was doing work on ancient city of Babylon. He was working on that primary residence, likely the place that Nebuchadnezzar had walked on the roof in verse 29 of chapter four, that palace that was some 630,000 square feet. Off the main room of that palace was discovered something like a, a banquet hall. Now we're, he, we're pretty sure that this is the room described here in this chapter. It was nearly 10,000 square feet. It had three entrances and a cutaway portion along the long wall that was most likely a raised area for the king's throne. It was an ornate hall. Uh, the Germans have reconstructed this from the thousands of bits of glazed tile. There were artistic glazed tiles that depicted all kinds of creatures in beautiful colors, brilliant blues and yellows. There were decorated columns and cedar doors overlaid with bronze. And then they discovered walls that had been covered with white gypsum, plaster. This wall became like a bulletin board recording the great achievements of the king. It was like a scorecard for all of his accomplishments. And so now on this wall by the lampstand so that everyone in the room could see it, at the apex of the crazed festivities, a dismembered hand began to write a cryptic message. Could you imagine the scene? The king saw it. Verse five, literally, the king was beholding it. He, he kept on staring. He was transfixed by what was clearly unnatural. It was supernatural. This produced for the king an instantaneous sobriety. Look down at verse six. The king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him. His hip joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. His face grew pale, literally his splendor changed. His, his brightness was transformed. He went white as a sheet. His thoughts were continually alarming him. And then the verse says his hip joints went slack. Literally, the knots of his loins loosened. At knots here in verse 6 is the same word we find down in verse 12 for knots. We read it a few moments ago. The explanation of enigmas, the solving of difficult problems is the loosening of knots that Daniel was capable of. Here in verse six, the knots of his loins were loosened. I think the idea here is the king's midsection knots were untied. He, it probably means he lost control of bladder and bowel functions. He soiled himself. He lost all composure. All regal dignity is gone at this point. And his knees began knocking together. Look, look at verse seven, the king called aloud. This is understated. The king screamed. He, he called out vehemently, the text says. He, he was yelling for his wise men, somebody get in here. He, he probably realized he was getting a message from the God he had just offended while enemy armies surrounded the city. Look, he's not even in control of his bodily functions, much, le much less his city or his empire. And so Belshazzar promises that anyone who can read and interpret the writing will get three things. The red purple, uh, that is the, the, the royal robe, the, the color that was made of the rarest dye and was only allowed to be worn by royalty. He was to get a gold chain. A gold chain was only allowed to be worn in public if the king gave it to you and if the king permitted you to wear it at that time. And such a man who could interpret the writing and its meaning would get third place of power in the kingdom. Third place of power, you're wondering, who's number two? What's fascinating about this is Belshazzar is number two. Who's number one? His father, Nabonidus, who may or may not be alive at this point, but is still the rightful king of the empire. Belshazzar is called king and he's king over the city. And that's why whoever could interpret the 
writing would be third place in the kingdom. And look at verse eight. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Literally, it is all the king's wise men were coming in, and, and you get this impression they were not all at once. They were trickling in as, as each heard of the urgency. They, they came in, and each successive entrance displayed the poverty of their wisdom. A wise guy comes in. Can you read that? Oh, I can't make that out at all. Do you know what it means? Sorry. Another guy comes in, and another guy comes in, and over and over and over again, it is the poverty of their wisdom, the emptiness of their conjuring, the folly of their religions, each one of them a reminder of the dead end of human wisdom when God stops the party. The dead end of human philosophy, human religion, human logic, human ideas, they are all emptiness and nothings. The music has stopped, and they have no answers. Why couldn't they read the writing? We find out later in this text, it is in Aramaic, the language that they would speak. Is it a difficult script? Is it a funny font? Is it the order of the letters and they can't make out the words? Or perhaps are the consonants ambiguous without the vowels? Is that cat, cut, or caught? I can't tell unless you tell me what the vowels are. Perhaps just the fact that they were single words and they didn't know how to make a sentence out of it. Nobody could come up with the answers. And this band of wise guys is once again exposed. And you're just reminded of Psalm 2, verse 4, that he who sits in the heavens laughs. Yahweh scoffs at them. Look down at verse 9. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. And everything we read about Belshazzar before has only been ramped up as each successive wise guy comes in and out with no answers. And now the nobles are perplexed. The, the thousand important people gathered, they've got their eyes on the king, and he doesn't have answers. He's scared. Now they're all scared. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where panic spread. I was in a cave in East Tennessee, and you get in deep enough, and you turn out all the flashlights, and you can't see your hand in front of your face. It's a darkness you can just about feel. And people are a little bit nervous. Caves are scary, and this is about a mile circular hike. And to do the circle, you have to enter through a small space you crawl through, birth canal type of deal. And then it opens up into this grand cave and, and you hike around and there are multiple layers, there are multiple stories, but you have to make it back to that small circle, small hole to get back out of the cave. And if you miss it, you're just going to keep going on a circle. Well, this group I was on was with about 20 people and a dog. And we missed the exit. And people start to ask questions like, hey, didn't we pass that rock before? And once somebody says that out loud, you can't stop the panic. And then somebody says, are we lost? <sighs> Thankfully, the leader backtracked us about 10 feet, found the birth canal. We got out, found the light. <laughs> That's all it took to induce panic was 10 feet past. And when the leader begins to panic and everybody is looking on, all the nobles are frightened. So this is the stupidest party interrupted by God himself. And then there is familiar help beginning in verse 10. Familiar help from an unknown source. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. And the queen spoke and said... And what we're going to find out is the answer is again on Daniel's lips. But it is the queen who bring Daniel's in and uh, brings Daniel in. She's an unknown character to us. She enters and she brings some help that is familiar to Babylon and familiar to us readers. But who is this queen? She's not a wife of Belshazzar. She's not already present in the banquet hall. His wives and concubines are there. She was not part of the festivities. 
but she is clearly respected and she has access to the feast even though she is uninvited and then she addresses the king in the presence of all and she takes charge. Look down at verse 11. She says, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. And she goes on and tells us his name is Daniel or Belteshazzar. This queen is old enough to know Daniel. This queen is old enough to have been familiar with the court of Nebuchadnezzar. She even uses phrases from Nebuchadnezzar's confessions. And she credits Daniel for being enlightened, intelligent, and possessing otherworldly wisdom. There's much debate amongst the historians about the identity of this queen. It is clear she's not a wife to Belshazzar, and she is universally considered to be a queen mother of sorts. But who is she? Notice that she calls Nebuchadnezzar Belshazzar's father. And by all historical accounts outside the Bible, Belshazzar is the son of Nabonidus, who's not even mentioned in this biblical narrative. Nebuchadnezzar's son was evil Merodach, who is attested in the Bible and outside the Bible as the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember that there were four kings of Babylon between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, but only 13 years separated their administrations. Remember that evil Merodach was assassinated and his brother-in-law usurped the throne. And his brother-in-law's son was assassinated when Nabonidus came to power. So Belshazzar is not not even in the bloodline according to that series of administrations. Back to Nebuchadnezzar. So in what sense can Nebuchadnezzar be called Belshazzar's father and who is this queen? Those questions are probably related. And I'll give you some options. Historians are divided on this. I'll give you my favorite option that the queen was the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. And if so, she could have been a grandmother to Belshazzar. Or secondly, that the queen was Nabonidus's wife. That's a possibility. Thirdly, if Nabonidus married a wife of Nebuchadnezzar after Nebuchadnezzar's death, perhaps in order to solidify power, kings inherited harems, she would have been both wife to Nebuchadnezzar and Nabonidus. Neb and Nab. And if Nabonidus adopted the sons of inherited wives, as Oriental kings did, maybe to secure a a guaranteed heir to his own throne, then Belshazzar could actually have been the direct son of Nebuchadnezzar adopted by Nabonidus. I like that theory. The queen could have been a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, married to Nabonidus for political reasons, making Belshazzar grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, And if that's the case, she could be the famed Nitocris, daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, that ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote about and commended her for her wisdom and her old age. So, we don't know the answer. I told you what my favorite view was. There are many ways that Belshazzar could actually have been blood-related to Nebuchadnezzar. But keep in mind, there is no Hebrew or Aramaic or Babylonian word for grandfather or for grandson. Your grandfather is just your father, and your great-great-great-great-grandfather is just your father. Remember that Messiah was called son of David. So father has some seven meanings attested to it in Aramaic. The word son has some 12 different meanings attested to it. And predecessor and successor are much used in that sense. It could simply mean that Belshazzar was a distant successor to Nebuchadnezzar. Whatever the case may be, whatever the relationship, whether he is direct bloodline, an actual direct son of Nebuchadnezzar, or just one who was his successor to the throne. All of those are legitimate possibilities. But Belshazzar would have had reason to demand in court to be known as son or successor to Nebuchadnezzar, leaving out all the other ones in between. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. He was great. He was brilliant. He was a genius. He was a brilliant military strategist that solidified the Babylonian Empire and made it the greatest empire to history to date on the earth. 
And then he moved from military general to architect and built out the greatest city on the earth. By the way, Belshazzar was not the only dictator to try to take Nebuchadnezzar's name for his own reputation building. More recently, Saddam Hussein did this, called himself the new Nebuchadnezzar and wanted to rebuild the glory of Babylon. The appeal to greatness and reputation of Nebuchadnezzar on Belshazzar's part seems to be totally without substance. It's ironic that historians totally forgot about him. In fact, by the time you get to the 4th and 3rd centuries BC, the Greek historians don't even mention Belshazzar as being a king in Babylon. And for this reason, for many years, people believed the Bible was wrong. The Bible says Belshazzar is king of of Babylon, but all history shows that Nabonidus was king of Babylon. History's right, the Bible's wrong. The problem is, they were reading 3rd and 4th century BC Greek historians. And when we found ancient Babylonian texts in the late 1890s and deciphered cuneiform, Belshazzar was everywhere. (laughs) And the liberals are besmirched again. Oh, the Bible's not true. We've never found Belshazzar. Then we find Belshazzar. Well, the Bible's not true for some other reason. (laughs) Again, the Bible is the anvil on which liberal criticism dies. Belshazzar is probably here claiming fame and greatness on the back of the reputation of Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 12. The queen goes on and says, your father made him chief of the magicians because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, the solving of difficult problems, that is the loosening of knots, were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Notice the queen twice calls him by his Hebrew name, Daniel. That's interesting. God is judge, or God is my judge, depending on how you spell it. This is remarkable. There there is a, a hangover from the old administration of loyalty even to the Hebrew name of Babylon on the lips of this Gentile queen. And even when she says, yeah, he was called Belteshazzar because that's what Nebuchadnezzar renamed him. She appeals to him as Daniel. And she asks for him to be called for. Help comes from the only true help available. Someone that is going to speak for God. Daniel is 80 years old at this point. Is he semi-retired? Where is he? Has he been forgotten, ignored, replaced? New administration, uh, new middle management, uh, Daniel's out. But this familiar scene is replayed for us again. God brings revelation. The empty heads gather and are exposed as frauds, and God's man is found and the truth is given. Do you remember the game Musical Chairs? Put a bunch of chairs in a circle put one more person than chairs and the music starts. And when the music stops, everybody sits down and one person's left out and they go and you take a chair out and you work it all the way down till there's one chair left. And when the music stops, only one person gets to sit down. If human history is like a giant game of musical chairs, there is a day coming when the music will stop There will only be one chair left, and the truth sits last. All the phonies and frauds, all the philosophies and fads, they will be out. And the true and living God, the God of Israel, the maker of heaven and earth, will have his day. He will be vindicated, and all those who love him, all those who trust him, will be on the right side of his story. God's going to stop the party. Will you be ready? Next time we're together, we'll, we'll get into some of the prophecies specifically concerning Babylon. But you need to know that none of this should have been a surprise to those who had God's word open. I'll give you a couple hints at these, at these things. Isaiah 21.9 says this, Now behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen and pairs, and one says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. Isaiah 44.28 says, 
It is I, God, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Cyrus is the Persian over the Persian and Medo armies who destroy the Babylonian Empire, who take over in Babylon this very night of this party. And God prophesied his arrival and the destruction of Babylon at his hands 150 years before it happened, and God named Cyrus by name before he was born. God named him before his parents did. Again, 150 years before Cyrus came, Isaiah 45, 1 and 2. Thus Yahweh says to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him, and listen to this, to loose the loins of kings. (laughs) Exactly what we just read. To open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. To go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. And we'll learn in a couple of weeks about how Babylon actually fell. And the details from God's promises are staggering. One more, Jeremiah 51. The sound of an outcry from Babylon and the great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans For the Lord is going to destroy Babylon and he will make her loud noise vanish from her. Their waves will roar like many waters. The tumult of their voices sounds forth. For the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men will be captured. Their bows are shattered. For Yahweh is a God of recompense. He will fully repay. I will make her princes and her wise men drunk. Her governors, her prefects, and her mighty men that they may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares the king, whose name is Yahweh of armies. Is God in control? (laughs) Of every iteration of human government, every successive attempt for petty kings on the earth to have their way, and God will have his way. He will keep his promises, and we can trust him. Every assault on the veracity of the word of God will fall the same way that those who didn't believe Isaiah and Jeremiah, those who didn't believe Daniel when he spoke, and the world arrayed against God's word and against God's truth and against God's people will be judged. God wins, and you want to be on his side. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the true and living God, the only one, you are peerless, you are sovereign, you are powerful, you are mighty and just. You hold the universe in the palm of your hand and you measure it by the span and the nations are a drop in the bucket and as dust on the scales and you will have your way. May we be humbled before you so that we confess your greatness and sing doxologies. I pray that no one in this room would be humbled by you when the party stops and it's too late. May everyone in this room, everyone hearing my voice cling to you in faith through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid for sins in his body on the cross that we might declare, be declared righteous before you and have access to you for all of eternity in your glorious goodness. It's in Jesus' name we pray it, amen.